Well, hello and welcome to another in the series, Building for the Future. And and I trust as we've been traveling verse by verse, chapter by chapter through Nehemiah, that exactly that's been happening. God's been building into us, laying principles brick by brick into our lives, preparing us for a more effective future in his service. You remember this uh, great verse in uh, Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the builder builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. And of course, we we know that. Unless God is doing the building into our hearts, into our ministries, it's going to be ineffective. But in in the journey of all of this, as we dig into the scriptures, we pray that these principles are going to equip us to be doing more for his kingdom, to be more effective in his ministries. Well, friends, today we're up to the generous leader, another important principle to build into our lives. We see Nehemiah models, you know, to be honest, extraordinary generosity. So let me set the context, though, first of all, the generous leader and uh, reading from Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 5. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found written there. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town in the company with Zerubbabel. And from there on, the passage, uh, as no doubt you've, you've seen if you've read ahead, is filled with a genealogical record, some 60 or so verses of it. And you might be thinking, why put such a huge chunk of Scripture? But it really, it's just telling us a bunch of people's names. And I can still remember when I was first reading the Bible as a new believer, I used to sometimes think to myself, with God being so creative, why does he have these quite boring chapters from time to time just listing names uh, but later on having you know studied uh, the historicity and the archaeological evidence and looking at, at topics such as apologetics and textual criticism you realize that there's God has purpose in doing that because many skeptics um, have come to the conclusion the Bible's nothing more than a, a book of religious pithy sayings But actually, it's things like genealogies that say, oh, no, this is actually clearly rooted in history. It's not just a kind of, you know, a bunch of religious sayings. No, this is an actual historic document. And grounded with passages like this, it helps us realise that is the case. Now, there is another reason, of course, that Nehemiah uh, chooses to include this. And it's because some people who had returned from Babylon were laying claim to acres of land saying it was their inheritance when they actually had no real claim to it. And so this genealogical record reveals who does have a genuine right to various areas of the land. Some of them didn't. Um, Now there's finally a fantastic little summary in 766 which uh, thankfully gives us a brief snapshot of the totality of those various um, genealogies. 66 says this, The whole company numbered about 42,360, besides 7,337 men servants and maid servants, they were of other nationalities besides um, not, not Jewish people in other words, they also had 245 men and women singers. There were 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels and 6,720 donkeys. It's surprising, isn't it, that the Bible would be so specific about these details. But once again, there we see this isn't just a a book of a few religious proverbs. This is a book that's rooted in history. Very clear, specific details. Well, let's move into this area of generosity. 770 tells us this. Some of the heads of the families contributed to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 drachmas of gold. 50 bowls and 530 garments for the priests. Once again, we see here in Nehemiah this commitment to worship. You know, he wanted the priests properly attired. And uh, the garments of the priests, because of the breastplate, were really expensive because there's uh, 12 gemstones on those breastplates, some of the gemstones being quite expensive. Let's have a a brief look at what uh, the priests used to wear. 
Now, as you can see from that image, we're talking about an expensive item of clothing. And so having bought some 530 of those garments, Nehemiah had really out, outlaid a lot of his resource to make sure priests were properly attired to make sure they had the golden bowls, which were part of the worship as well. Another big outlay there, buying golden bowls. Um, and, but finally, Nehemiah also gives a lot financially. Uh, you'll notice it mentions 1,000 drachmas of gold. Now, I wonder how much that was. Uh, well, uh, a 1,000 drach drachmas of gold is approximately 8.6 kgs of gold. Now, as you can imagine immediately, that's a lot of money. <laughs> so according uh, to the uh, latest search that I did on the price of gold bullion in Australia, one kg in Australia is currently worth $79,656 for one kg. He gave about 8.6 kg, so he gave a total of something like $685,000 worth of gold. Quite a substantial offering. You know, and so here we see this strong generosity here. Now, I, I realise Nehemiah, of course, was um, a wealthy man. Being cupbearer to the King Artaxerxes would have meant he would have been paid extremely well. But even wealthy people don't part with about $700,000 easily. And so here we do see a, a great example of generosity in Nehemiah's life. You know, and I know sometimes we look at something like that and you think, well, how could you relate that to today? No one's going to be giving that sort of money into a ministry today. You know, um, a couple of years back, I was chatting with someone who was at the International Alpha Conference. And at that conference, they were telling me that there was um, a bloke, they, they were sitting there. He was an Aussie fella. And he had committed to give to Alpha over the next three years $1.5 million. Seriously. Uh, half a million every year for the next three years. So people really do make those significant financial sacrifices for the sake of God's work. Can I ask you this? Well, can I make this statement? Number one, as a leader, Nehemiah set the example of generous financial giving. First point, number one, as a leader, Nehemiah set the example of generous financial giving. So the question, you know, immediately we should be always asking ourselves when we see something in scripture how can I apply that to my life am I someone who has that sense of I need to be generous when it comes to God's work um, is that something I've ever even thought into you know uh, the challenge is there too of course Nehemiah modeled it as a leader so if I'm a leader in the church am I generous with my finances for God's kingdom always a good question to ask ourselves um, I remember in one of my churches, my treasurer, actually, John, at uh, Narry Warren Baptist, uh, he'd been the treasurer there for, goodness knows, 13 years or something. In totality, he was the treasurer. And uh, he, as an elected leader, um, you know, he had to be voted in on each occasion, but he did a marvellous work as the treasurer. But I knew as well uh, how much he gave. I didn't know how much most people gave, but I didn't know how much John gave. And he was one of our, probably as a, uh, on a consistent level, Month by month, he was our biggest giver. So he didn't just do the role. Um, he very much modelled generosity. Uh, classic example there of him setting the example of being a generous leader. Looking at the next passage, uh, 771. Some of the heads of families gave to the treasury for the work, 20,000 drachmas of gold and 2.2 hundred Oh, sorry, 2.2 thousand miners of silver. The total given by the rest of the people was 20,000 drachmas of gold and 2,000 miners of silver and 67 garments for the priests. So you get the idea, the heads of family who were wealthy, they gave about 20,000 drachmas of gold plus some silver. Um, and then the, the general populace, some of whom would have been very poor, but they managed a total of about 20,000 drachmas of gold as well much bigger group of course um, now I wonder what sort of money are we talking about though uh, well um, let's let's have a look at um, silver bullion at the moment one kg of silver bullion according to uh, Perth Mint uh, is valued at $875 so one kg of silver is about $875 uh, the amount of miners they gave, 4,200 miners of silver, that's equivalent to 2.3 thousand kg. Uh, so in other words, uh, 2,300 kg of silver times $875 is 
is a little over $2 million in silver. Now we move on to the gold. 40,000 drachma, uh, 40, drachmas of gold given in total. I wonder how much that is. Well, let's, uh, let's work this out as well. Um, remember I said uh, how much a drachma of gold was before. Well, 40,000 drachmas of gold equals about 344 kg. So that's 344 kg times the $79,656 per kg of gold equals 27,400,000. Uh, let's put them all together. The governor's gift uh, is some 685,000. The silver was over 2 million. The gold was about 27,400,000. It's a total of over $30 million given in this one-off offering. Um, so we see substantial generosity here uh, from these guys. Um, 30 million. You know, how much was in your offering this week? Well, 30 million. You know, so it's uh, quite an extraordinary amount. Uh, higher level of generosity. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I've seen over the years as uh, God calls his people to various commitments in his work, a fact is I've seen sometimes God calls his people to extraordinary levels of financial giving. Number two, sometimes God calls his people to extraordinary levels of financial giving. Now, uh, what was this money for? Uh, well, amongst other things, it would have been for the running of the temple. So you've, you've got the, the Levites. Now, first of all, the priests, uh, they were called to lead in ritual worship, uh, offerings of the perfect, perfect lambs without blemish, etc. They were available for spiritual counsel. They would do public readings of scripture and they would preach the word of God. And then you've got the scribes, a big army of scribes. Uh, their role was to write, very painstaking this, and they would write on parchment, the scrolls, the scriptures. Uh, and that's the only way you could get them at that time. There was no such thing as a printing press in those days. And so they had to painstakingly be written out. So a big army of scribes was employed. And then there's the Levite musicians and singers. Uh, they would lead the nation in worship, compose songs of praise. And teams of them would actually constantly offer worship and prayer in the temple. Um, you know... Just to make the point again, sometimes God calls his people to extraordinary levels of financial giving. And, you know, I guess there would almost certainly be some listening today that that's you. You've had seasons in your life when you know you've given, you know, way beyond the norm. You've given an extraordinary offering to God, you know, a, an, a, a, an abundant or extravagant offering to God. But as I share this too, it's, there are others who've never done anything like that in their life. And wonders why anyone would be so stupid. You know, can I challenge you today? What would God say to you about giving an extravagant offering in his service beyond the norm? Um, you know, I remember the um, term that I was uh, teaching this about a decade ago at Nary Warren. I was actually teaching uh, the, the book of Nehemiah. Uh, it's a long time back now, about a, about a decade ago. But um, as I was um, speaking early in, in the series, I remember getting a phone call from um, John, the treasurer, the same guy I was talking about, and he was just chatting about several things. But one of the things he told me was we'd received two substantial generous offerings that month. And so one guy had direct debited $10,000 as a special gift, and another family had direct debited $32,000 as a gift and some of you are thinking I can't believe that well you, people actually do that they're given this extravagant offering or as I've been calling it an extraordinarily an extraordinary offering and um, there was a chap later on years later when we were doing our, our building and we were raising money for the building fund our, our chairperson of the building committee uh, he was an engineer by profession anyway good person to be leading that committee but i know he also gave a one-off offering into the building fund on this occasion of thirty-seven thousand dollars and so yeah people really do this um, why have i never had an openness to this you know or have i am i in a place where i think i can't even get my head around how anyone could ever give that sort of money well, it really happens. Now, you might be saying to yourself, yeah, but Lee, isn't that an Old Testament thing? Like, I, know, I knew there was stuff in the Old Testament where people, you know, give substantial offerings to the temple. Or that, but that's not a New Testament thing, is it? Oh, well, let's have a look. Let's see if there's that, that sort of uh, extraordinarily 
large offerings given in the New Testament. Well, let's have a look at Acts 4.32 through 35. Let's read this. 4.32 Acts. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land, lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. I mean, clearly there we're seeing that there were extraordinary offerings that were given in the New Testament too. I mean, you try and picture this for a moment. There are people selling properties and bringing the entire amount and laying it at the apostles' feet. There are people who are are selling houses. Um, You can imagine that today. Like you've, you've got this holiday home, you know, down on Phillip Island. You sell it and you bring the entire proceeds and give it as an offering to the local church or for overseas missions. Or, you, you know, you've got this investment property somewhere and you decide to sell it and you bring the entire proceeds into the local church or cross-cultural missions. You know, it, it just seems mind-boggling for some people and yet this is what the early church was doing. Um, now who were the apostles whose feet they laid at that? Well, they were simply the, the key leaders of the church um, and they're the primary leaders of what was, of course, by this time, a very, very large church in Jerusalem. Uh, we're told there were 5,000 men in the church, so double that out with women, 10,000. And I guess, logically, there'd have been three to 5,000 kids. So this could be a church of perhaps 14, up to 15,000, somewhere around there. And so when you're talking about those sort of numbers, clearly it's a mega church. And yet it said there was no needy persons amongst them. No needy persons at a time in the Roman Empire when there was plenty of poverty and it just shares that again the ministries of the church were such they were taking care of the needy. They were looking after them, making sure they had what they needed. Um, Well, it was possible because of other people's generosity. The calling, of course, of the apostles was to preach the word of God. It was to share the gospel. It was to make disciples. They were people of prayer. And, of course, the miraculous work of God was operating through them, the driving out of demons and the healing of the sick. Well, the passage goes on and identifies a particular person with this extraordinary gift. 436 Acts, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So here's a specific person. Barnabas, again, sells a field, gives that money in totality into the local church ministries. Extraordinary phenomena. You know, um, but the, the question begs for us today to ask, you know, have I ever given an extraordinary offering into God's work it's, it's funny actually reading this in one sense because uh, we're reading about Nehemiah, who's Jewish, and the early church was predominantly Jewish as well there in, in, as uh, this church was in Jerusalem. And yet, of course, we, we think of the Jews as being pretty stingy. I mean, that's their reputation has been for a, a lot of generations, and yet here we're seeing real generosity. Actually, this reminds me of a joke. There was um, three ministers of religion. Yeah, you had a Baptist pastor, an Anglican vicar and a Jewish rabbi. Now, these three guys were good friends. And they had, a, had, had their uh, uh, churches and, and the, the synagogue in the heart of the city. And there was quite a famous coffee shop that was you know, known for a great coffee. And so they would meet up there for a fantastic brew every um, month or so and have a talk, you know, chin wag about various things, good friends. And one time they got talking about giving, about their financial commitment to God's work and anyway um, they were asking each other you know how they do that and the Baptist guy looked really embarrassed and he said well look I'll tell you but you you know my colleagues would think I was very strange if uh, they knew this so keep it quiet so what I actually do you know in the Baptist church we value the word of God so once a month I get my stipend out in cash of what I've been paid that month and I draw a chalk circle around the pulpit And um, I throw that cash up in the air and everything that falls inside the circle, I give to God as my offering for that month. And he was he was ready for some laughter and ridicule. But the Anglican guy is just nodding and smiling. And he said, I can't believe it. 
I do something very similar, he says. You know, my, my church, there's that kind of that, that stairway thing up to um, the pulpit where I give the morning address. Um, I actually do something similar. When the church is empty, I um, draw a chalk circle down the bottom of that, that stairway and I go up to the top of there and in my case, I get the stipend out, throw the cash out and everything that falls outside the circle, I give to God. And these guys are kind of connecting with each other and nodding and, and then they turn to the Jewish rabbi and he's just looking at them, shaking his head. He said, guys, guys, you are so unspiritual. You know, what's this thing about circles? You don't need a circle. What I do is every Sabbath day, um, well, uh, I, I take my stipend out, just the week of the stipend balanced out for them and I throw it up into the air and everything God wants he takes and everything that falls down must be mine. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, let's, have a, let's have a look at um, some connected verses here. As you know, this chapter is mainly genealogical record, but there are some good links here to generosity in chapter 10 of Nehemiah. So let me just have a look at three short passages here. It says in Nehemiah 10.32, We assume the responsibility for carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of our God. For the bread set out on the table, for the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, for the offerings on the Sabbaths, new moon festivals and appointed feasts, and for the holy offerings, for the sin offerings, to make atonement for Israel and for all the duties of the house of our God. Um, so here's an unusual offering that uh, Nehemiah identifies one mentioned in earlier chapters of the Old Testament and that is the giving of a third of a shekel once a year and so as part of their giving they would do that and now now I wonder what on earth a third of a shekel is (laughs) well a shekel was at that time approximately a month's wage and so once a year as part of this shekels offering they would give a third of a month's wage as an annual offering into the temple um, I wonder how would that work out today? Well, purely from a financial perspective, uh, you might be surprised by this, but I just did uh, some research on what the average salary is currently in Melbourne, the average full-time salary, and it's now $91,000 per annum. Uh, well, you divide that by 12 and you're left with $7,583. Uh, so uh, they gave about a third of that, which is about 2,527. So basing it on our modern day uh, monetary system, they must have given about two and a half grand once a year as that one, uh, one third of a shekel's offering. Now you might be thinking, well, how on earth do you relate to that today? But one of the things I'm aware of that quite a few people do that actually is very similar to that, I know quite a few people who give in their tax return as an offering to God's work. Um, and it often is about two and a half grand. It's just an annual thing, but it's been done quite a, quite a while in um, a number of churches by people. In fact, uh, Pamela and I have done that quite a bit ourselves. But it would be equivalent to that sort of thing. But I wonder for you, number three, how can you apply the, one, the annual one-third of a shekel offering to your giving plan? Number three, how can you apply the annual one-third of a shekel offering to your giving plan? The next passage, 1035 of Nehemiah, says this. We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops of every fruit tree. It is, as it is written in the law, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle and of our herds and of our, and of our flocks to the house of God, to the priests ministering there. Moreover, We will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of our ground meal, of our grain offerings, of our fruit of all of our trees, and of our new wine and oil. Now this is one that you might be a little more familiar with. It's uh, often referred to as the first fruits offering. You've got the idea that uh, part of what they also did was the first of that harvest or of those new lambs that were born or of the cattle that were born, of the first harvest of of, um, the vineyard or the first produced wine or the new oil, whatever, they would give something of that first uh, amount that they received. In fact, it also mentions 
that they could also give their firstborn son into the, the ministry and working as uh, someone in the temple, which was considered a great privilege, or they didn't have to do that. The other option was they give an offering, a substantial offering usually, instead of that. Um, so this was another pattern uh, that people used to live by. Now, I realise you're thinking, well, how on earth do I apply that? You know, I mean, I don't have, um, I don't have any vineyards, don't have any sheep, don't have any cows, you know, I don't have any crops. You know, how, how do I bring the first fruits offering to God? Well, let me suggest this. This is how a lot of people have applied it. You know, sometimes God blesses us financially or materially with something new. It, you know, it might be a salary bonus, a gift, uh, it might be a government payout some new employment position or perhaps a promotion that has resulted in a higher payment. You know, um, and so some people have actually make a decision to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm, because of this new blessing God's given me, I'm going to give him a portion of that new blessing. Um, one of my, actually, I still remember a, a girl at church one day coming forward for prayer uh, at the end of the service and she said, you know, uh, I'm really praying about this new job I'd love to apply for she was telling me about it and uh, I thought yeah it'd be a good good fit good match and so we prayed into it asking God that he'd open the doors that the interview would go well and uh, she'd be picked and uh, about three weeks later she came up to me after a service and she was very excited and she said oh I got the job I got the job and you know what I'm so thankful to God my first month's salary the whole month's salary my first month I'm going to give that to God and this is what she says as a first fruits offering that was her actual phrasing but let me ask you the question number four have you considered giving of a first fruits offering ever thought about that have you considered the giving of a first fruits offering into God's work finally last passage Nehemiah ten thirty seven, and we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Aaron is to accompany the Levites when they receive the tithes and the Levites are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of our God to the storerooms of the treasury. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine and oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary are kept and where the ministering priests the gatekeepers and the singers stay. We will not neglect the house of our God. And so here, the one that we're probably most familiar with is the tithe. Um, I remember being in a Bible study group once years ago, and I asked the group, um, what is a tithe? And one of my friends, Troy Mason, spoke up and said, a tithe is a percentage uh, I asked the group to clarify a little bit more and of course people spoke up and said well it's not just a percentage it's specifically 10 percent tithe literally means a tenth and so here we're seeing that part of what they did the, the people of Israel is they would give a tenth of their produce or of their resource into the temple um, and let me raise this question do you have faith to be obedient in the giving of a tithe of your income to the work of God Number five, do you have faith to be obedient in the giving of a tithe of your income to the work of God? Well, we've covered four areas. You know, uh, the studies revealed to us four different levels of giving that God's people participated in. There was the extraordinary giving, the annual commitment of a third of a shekel, the offering of the first fruits of God's blessing, and the consistent giving of the tithe. Uh, so in, in summary, let's look at them. The extraordinary offering, the shekel offering, the first fruits offering, the tithe offering. Again, the extraordinary offering, the shekels offering, the first fruits offering, and the tithe offering. Now, you might be saying at the moment, well, Lee, that is just way confusing. I mean, I, there's you know, one or two of those I haven't even heard of before. You know, um, you know I, I can't even get my head around all that. And, uh, you know, the first thing I'd, I'd say to anyone, uh, you know, if you're not in the pattern of tithing, I mean, that's really the only one you need to be thinking about. If that's new to you, you've never done it before, that would really be the most down to earth or most logical thing to pray into and start considering. Um, obviously, it's different. If you are a tither already, you might want to pray into one of those other areas also. But I realise in any church, you know, it's probably no more than about 20% of people who are tithing. 
and uh, they are actually they carry the finances of the church pretty much. Uh, and uh, other people may contribute a little, but really they are the primary people who carry it. Uh, so my challenge today is, would you consider praying into God, um, should I become a tither? And I know that the immediate thought that many people have is, well, Lee, look, I'd love to, I'd love to give into God's work, but I don't think you understand the financial situation of our family. I mean, we can barely make ends meet. You know, we, we, we're really struggling to pay the bills. There's no way we could tithe. I'd love to, but we just we haven't got the dough. And uh, can I suggest that that's a, that's a very common way that um, people look at it. And there's a reason they look at it that way. People don't tithe because they look at it as just another expenditure. But I want to make the suggestion that actually the scriptures don't teach, it, teach about it that way at all. They teach about tithing as actually an investment. Now, let me show you the difference. Uh, for instance, um, we're all used to say um, buying a car. You know that that car in five years or so, normally it depreciates to the point where it's only worth about half what we paid for it or less. It's an expenditure. But also, if you think in terms of buying a house, you buy a house, 12 years, 13, 14 years later, it's worth twice what you paid for it. It's an investment. And God, time and time again in his scriptures, speaks in terms of sowing into his kingdom as an investment. What does he mean? Well, he promises a return. He promises, he promises blessings when you put him first with your resources, with your finances. Um, let me tell you a little story here about Craig Winkler. Um, Pastor Stuart Robinson was uh, telling me this, this story actually some years back. Uh, some of you um, probably know, know Craig or know of him. So Craig, uh, back in the early 90s, he started a business. In 1991, he co-started MYOB. Um, a very clever, catchy title. It was all a software company that helped people you know, manage their finances within their company. And, of course, it stood, stood for Mind Your Own Business. And, of course, when people ask, oh, what's this new company? Uh, what's it stand for? MYOB? Mind Your Own Business. What do you mean? No, that's what it stands for, Minding Your Own Business. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and, of course, um, you've heard the story. Although it, it didn't take off immediately, um, Craig was just running it from his garage initially, but Stuart told me that in those early days, Craig had made a commitment to whatever salary he paid himself that 10% of that was going to be going to Crossway Baptist. He was going to be tithing. And uh, it would have been difficult in the, just the early days when they were starting because there wasn't much. Well, then the thing really took off, absolutely exploded. In fact, um, I remember chatting with a guy who also worked for MYOB one day because I used to walk down from Crossway, just a short walk to MYOB to have lunch. And they had a nice cafe there and so I sometimes have lunch there. And I was chatting with one of the other guys that was employed by MYOB but also went to Crossway. And he said, you know, Lee, over the last 10 years, uh, the business has grown so rapidly, we are employing two full-time people every week. Over 100 full-time people every year now for over 10 years. And he affirmed also that Craig is extraordinarily generous into the work of God. Um, now, I, I do, do remember that, uh, uh, I think it was probably about 2012, I was at a men's breakfast thing and um, went along. It's not a big group of people at Crossway. There was probably only about 60 or so of us there. And um, later on, we had some roundtable discussions. I was sitting next to Craig and I knew he wasn't the CEO anymore of uh, MYOB and I wanted to know why. So I was having a chat with him and he said, oh, well, there was um, basically an American hostile takeover and uh, they didn't want me. So, you know, he moved out. Uh, but as God looked after him, well, he certainly did. Um, shortly after that, uh, Craig then joined in 2009 uh, zero. He invested 14.7 million into that rival company. Uh, he's currently a shareholder and the non-executive director. Um, last time I checked, uh, Craig, that was just a couple of years ago, Craig was the 12th wealthiest man in Australia in tech. So um, God has continued to bless him and he's lived out a principle that really we find here in this verse in Corinthians. Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 11. 
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Did you hear verse 11 there, what it said? Doesn't even sound biblical, does it? You will be made generous, you'll be made rich rather in every way. You'll be made rich in every way. I mean, why would God want to make people rich? That doesn't make any sense at all. That's crazy. You know, that's an ungodly thing, isn't it? But you, you see what follows after it. You'll be made rich in every way. Why? So you can be generous on every occasion. And here's a classic example of where Craig had lived that out. And no matter how much he gave away, God just kept pouring more resource into his pockets that he could be generous on every occasion. And uh, I, remember, I still remember Stuart telling me that whenever there was a need at Crossway, there were a few people that would chip in and you'd regularly get these uh, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 you know, de- debits coming in from Craig whenever there was needs. Friends, shall we pray together? Father, here today, as we've been greatly challenged by a passage that talks about the extraordinary giving of the Jewish people, Father, we see this taught in Scripture and I realise for many that's perhaps the most challenging area to ever hear a message about. And yet there it is, woven through Scripture. Father, I pray today, I know there are some in the church who give very generously, they're tithing on a regular basis and it, it's, it's at a cost to them and uh, yet they keep on making that sacrifice and commitment. Father, I pray you bless their finances, Lord. Um, re- reward them richly for their commitment to you and your kingdom. But I pray as well, Father, for, for others who might be just considering this and thinking, Lee, I can't afford it. It's just, you know, there's no way I could live out this principle. I just pray for people on their journey that as they consider what you might have them do, how you might have them to live. Father, help us to be a people who don't just pick and choose what we want to obey in the Bible. That as we read the New Testament, as we open our hearts to the various passages of Scripture, as we dig into the principles of the Old Testament, Lord, that you'd help us not to just pick and choose and say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going I'm to obey that, but it's no way I'm doing that. But rather get to the point where we're willing to say, hey, God, I want to embrace your word as a whole. Because if Jesus is really Lord of all, he's Lord of every area of my life. And if he's not Lord of all, then I guess he's not Lord at all because I'm still picking and choosing what he can have authority over. Father, help us to be a surrendered people. Last week we mentioned the scripture, uh, surrendering our lives as a living sacrifice. Father, we pray that we might consider our lives not of our own, but all that we possess, who all that we are is yours, Lord. Help us to be surrendered to you as our true God of all gods and Lord of all lords. In Jesus' name, amen.